Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the second series of the Haiku P podcast. I'm Patricia and this week I would like to talk to you about musicality in haiku, to bring you the latest from our second Renku and to finish I'm delighted to feature the poet Isabel Caves. Before I continue, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping. The next podcast will be Haiku and Senryu on the theme of men. The deadline is the 11th of November, but the podcast itself will be later than usual because I have an extremely busy November, and I expect to publish around about the 30th of November. Apologies to everyone for being late. Now, I was reading something that Florence Villain wrote. A poem worth reading is worth reciting and will gain by it. I think many of you agree with her, as you've written to me to say that you really enjoy listening to the verses being read out. The consensus of opinion seems to be that it gives you a new perspective on not just your own work, but the writing of other poets. I'm delighted to hear that because I love reading poetry and I'm very passionate about listening to it. Many thanks to everyone who's written to me. It's really encouraging. Let's talk music. Initially, I got to thinking about this topic some time ago because I wanted to submit to a particular journal, which specifically requested musicality in verse. And I couldn't really figure out what they meant, even by reading past editions. So I just got to puzzling it out by myself. Eventually, I concluded that in my mind, what constitutes musicality in haiku comes from the sound, rhythm and movement of the verse. But as you know, I'm quite happy for you to contradict me, so feel free to email me. Then, as I started doing my research for this week's episode, I came across something that Claire Everett had written in Volume 29, Number 2 of the Journal of the British Haiku Society, Blythe Spirit. She was one of the judges of the 2018 Haiku Awards, and she wrote this. My favourite haiku are small hymns to nature. They vibrate the very atoms of our being in the same way that bees hum the blossoms and the wind sings the grass. And you know, this summed up nicely how I feel about haiku. As I said before, I love to read poetry, but I enjoy it maybe even more when I listen to poetry. And to me, musicality, even discordant musicality, is important. So then I began to think about how I could improve my haiku and senryu by being more aware of their melody. And I thought perhaps some of you would be interested to hear about my musings and conclusions. Perhaps some of what I say will resonate with you, perhaps not. Please, please tell me if you have any other ideas. Because as you know, I'm always trying to improve my writing. After some thought... I selected some poetic devices which I can use to improve this element, musicality that is, of my own haiku writing. This is my initial shortlist. Repetition, onomatopoeia, assonance, consonance, alliteration and improving how I use the cut. Repetition can have a lot of different effects on a poem. It creates surprise, anticipation and movement, and I have some verses that I hope will illustrate how it can convey movement. George Swede Dropping stone after stone into the lake, I keep reappearing. M. L. Bittle de Lapa Firefly there, not there, there. Now onomatopoeia Isn't that a word that resounds in your head? Onomatopoeia. I'm sure you've all heard of it before, but just in case, it's a word that phonetically mimics or resembles the sound of the thing it describes. The use of such words deliciously accentuates the sound within the verse. When used well, it can aid your imagination and, of course, describes a situation without the use of further words, which is rather useful, given that we're writing haiku, which really try to be brief. I have some examples. Wayne Kingston 
Fallen carpet trail. Crunch on yellow, red, amber. Dew point drop. Allegria Imperial. The song I used to hear, swish swash of a bamboo broom. John Hawkhead. Late autumn breeze, the trembling shivers in butterfly wings. I just love it when I spot assonance and consonance in verses, but I'm really not very good at using them in my own work. As you probably know, assonance is the repetition of vowel sounds in a phrase or sentence. For example, light my fire. What I found out in my research, and I didn't know before, is that apparently words that are vowel-heavy create a more musical sound. And as if to prove the case, I read a prose piece by Jonathan Roman today which used the word mellifluous, and a verse by S. Zylenga which used the word seething, both of which brought the point home to me. Thanks, chaps. Now, consonants is the repetition of consonant sounds in a phrase or sentence. Here's just an example to illustrate. She sells seashells by the seashore. Which, as you noticed, is also an example of alliteration. Now, to me, that example is a little bit discordant to the ear. But I'm sure we can all think of music that is cacophonous or jarring rather than melodic. Can't we? Well, in case you can't, I've added a few to the show notes, which are a bit discordant to my ear. You may disagree, of course. One person's cacophony is another person's melody. Have you got any other examples? Anyway, back to the topic. I found a couple of verses to help me illustrate these methods. Or at least I hope they do. For assonance, for example. Adam Trainer. The long A of grey. The long A of rain. The shortest day. From Nick Vergilio. Spentagon. Pentagony. Repentagon. And from Peggy Willis Lyles. Marsh lights. The owl's cry dilates our eyes. And let's throw in a little bit of consonants. Nick Vergilio again. The sack of kittens sinking in the icy creek increases the cold. Rosa Maria de Salvatore. Quiet night. Listening to the whisper of the grass. And now a couple of alliteration examples. Lauren Ford. Migrating eels. The warp and the weave of creek water. Prad Afachan, the last light, dyeing the sky a little less blue. And then what of the cut? In the same way that white is a non-colour, and yet you can see it, so too, I think, is silence a non-sound, and yet you can hear it. Often it creates movement in the verse. Rebecca Lilly, misty pine-scented wind drifts through the graveyard. I've outlived my parents. Tito, having brought us along to the sky, the summer moor ends. Francine Banworth, living alone, both ends of the wishbone. The more I think about it, the more ideas I come up with to improve the melody in my verses. But I could go on and on. And I just wanted to give a little snapshot of some ideas that we could all use. What I've learned is certainly giving me food for thought. And if I'm honest, it's sort of frightening me a little bit in that I have so much to learn. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting for you and that you've enjoyed the verses I've brought to the podcast this week. But that's not it. Because next... I'd like to update you with the progress of our Renku. Do you know, it's been an absolute pleasure to work on so far, and I'd like to thank the following poets for their collaboration. Kim Russell, Richard Bailey, Wendy C. Bialek, M. Shane Pruitt, Veronica Hosking, James Young, Andrew Sire, 
S. Silenga, B. S. Saroja, and Ricky Rivers Jr. If you'd like to know which poet wrote which verse, please go to the website poetryp.com, click on Renku 2, and you'll see it in all its glory. Let's hear the Renku. Marble steps, sculpted by endless souls, a welcome chill. Mural tablets, how ancient my son's name. Wind in the willows, unanticipated storm, green blades impaling. Will the night be dark or give no shelter? Kissed moon, all those unfinished poems under water. Empty leaves, the fading colours. An old quilt, grandmother's warmth passes down. Bitterly cold, she adds peat to the fire. Hypnotic glow, involuntary shiver reaches his soul. Snow glitter in the alpine air. Shawl bent, the long trudge through winter, collecting logs. A returning trapper offers his assistance. Breaking bread, news from another village, northern lights. The sky lamp shines long tonight. Lovebirds. Urgent flight. Whisking winds, gallows bright. Let's finish today with a little treat. Or should I say, another little treat. Most months, we hear a little something from Isabel Caves. She's a very accomplished haiku poet from New Zealand. But today, I thought we should hear just a little bit more than one verse, and so I give you a small selection of Isabel's work. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Desert Oak The Many Shapes of Stillness Cereal Bowl A painted fairy tells her it'll be okay. Nightfall A lily pad catches the moon. Lovely, Isabel. If I had to pick a favourite, it would be Cereal Bowl. A painted fairy tells her it'll be okay. Makes me think of childhood. We probably all needed that cereal bowl as a child, at least once in a while, didn't we? Thank you so much for coming along and listening to me today. I really enjoyed finding the verses, working with you on the Renku, and hearing a little bit more from Isabel. Cheers, Isabel. The next podcast is our special one on the topic of men. I'm really looking forward to that podcast, I can tell you. Thanks to everyone who's sent verses so far. But there's always room for more, and the deadline is the 11th of November. Please send your verses by email, though. Otherwise, I just can't keep track of things. I'm looking forward to speaking to you soon. But in the meantime, keep writing. Don't forget you can find lots of bits and pieces on the show notes. And if something's missing, just email me and I'll sort it out for you. Ciao.